Hey, what's going on, everybody? Today is April 23rd, 2024, and you're listening and watching the Daily AI Show live. And today, if you can see our screen, it's all about decoding some AI jargon, some terms, some acronyms. You know, what is in a name? Um, we've got Junmi, Andy, Robert, and I'm Brian. And, you know, we're going to throw out some some terms that we think are important and explain why we why it's important to know what they mean in terms of business value. Um, but we would also love it if you're listening here uh, live to, you know, throw any questions or comments in, you know, ask us about a term. We'll we'll certainly give our take on it. So if you have suggestions, we have uh, thoughts or comments along the way or questions, uh, feel free to throw that into the chat either on, you know, our YouTube or, or LinkedIn Live. And we will certainly do our best um, to bring them into the conversation. So we were talking right before we went live and we were like, okay, how do we want to organize this? And what we're going to do our best to do is number one, not just throw out rapid fire 150 terms. You know, there's there's Google for that. Um, what we want to do is put a little bit more meaning and in, in, um, understanding behind some of these terms. Also, though, for the sake of keeping things more streamlined, we're going to try our best to start with some of the more simplistic terms, basic terms, and move throughout the course of the next 30-ish minutes of the show towards some of the more complex terms. So that's the goal for today um, is to just sort of go there. And I don't know, guys, if there's like, you know, do we want to start as like, you know, a, a definition of AI? And I don't mean that like as a throwaway. The, the reality is, I think AI and things like LLMs and even things like machine learning, if I go back to like 2017, when I was in more working in the business intelligence space, Machine learning was the term that everybody wanted to use on their website. Today, it might be chat or an LLM or something like that. So I think some of these sort of more basic terms get confused sometimes. Um, I don't know, Andy, Robert, I guess, Robert, you got something to show here. Yeah. So why, this, why don't you start is, us off here? Oh, yeah, I like these slides that you did. Yeah, so shame, shameless plug. Uh, this is one of the slides from a presentation I do when I do workshops. Yeah. And I love this because um, I, I kind of stole the idea from a workshop that I had attended but if you look at the terminology of AI and you, you hear it constantly in 60 minutes and in YouTube videos and everybody, they use the, ter the two letters too, too much. And so AI is, is like saying, um, I eat food. And it's, it's like food is too generic of a term. Like I like, you know, Asian food. That's still too generic. Like I like noodles. Okay, they're getting better. So we're looking at if you look at the terminology, let's start on the, the biggest sphere, the biggest sphere being artificial intelligence. And so that's basically making computers so that they think and act the way that humans do or process like humans do. That's the, the, the goal. AI has been around for 60, 70 years. So it's not nothing new in that, in that scope. Then you go down one layer and it's machine learning. Algorithms that get better, the more data they see, right? Then there's deep learning. And then inside of deep learning, you have generative AI. And even inside of that, you also have large language models. So when you think of that as the context of what most of the time we're talking about on this show is in the deep learning sphere. Uh, sometimes you'll have the robots, which is uses deep learning, but it's machine learning as well. So I think most of where people are excited with ChatGPT, the anthropics of the world, we're really in the subset of deep learning, which is the large language models, the conversational AI. Um, generative AI. Those those are what we're mostly talking about these days. Um, I think this is a, a good way to, um, to 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 categorize those terms. And now obviously, they're generic terms, but how they relate to each other is important. That's that's super helpful. And if you didn't, if, you know, if you're just listening to us, I highly recommend you know going over to YouTube or Spotify, and you can actually see the video on this because what Robert shared is a really nice graph, or I would say, uh, yeah, like almost like an infographic of the the circles within the circles, and like he was explaining breaking it down. So highly recommend uh, going back and, and doing that. That was awesome. That's a great that's a great start to this. So okay, so you're right. Like when you, I say this oftentimes too. If you go on to LinkedIn and you search for jobs and you put in AI today, like as of April 23rd, more than likely you're going to see like machine learning coding jobs still. Right. That's the AI jobs were more likely. They're looking for people who understand how to write code, how to build models. These are engineer type jobs a lot of times. Mm -hmm. In the future, 
we, I don't know if that balance will tip totally, but you will see more like what you were just talking about, Robert, I think, which is in the deep learning side, that even if we go deeper than that, the generative AI side of things, where you're going to have people hiring and saying, we need people with really good communication skills. And we need you to be able to deploy new, let's say, custom GPTs or something like that and understand how to write the language, you know, to get the best result out of it or to train our internal employees or whatever the case is, you might work in training or something. So we don't really see that as much today. But I think it's worth pointing out that I don't know, I'll take your guys opinion on it, too. But I definitely see more of the still coding side of it, like the engineer side of AI, and not as much, you know, in the generative AI as of today. Yeah, well, I have um, to agree. I think it's, I think we're going to see that for a while, uh, mainly because uh, there's a recognized um, shallow end of the talent pool currently. So uh, as as we ramp up and get AI integrated into uh, just more use or or more companies uh, and systems, then we'll uh, we'll see what we're going to see that. Uh, uh, that trend for a while, and, but uh, I'm hoping it'll get to the uh, uh, to the other side of things pretty soon. But I mean, I know we're getting a little off topic, but I think it's important to to follow up on that and say that the bigger problem I think is that they're they're not quite expertise in those new lanes. This is a new this is a new um, uh, horizon, a new uh, uh, what do you call uncharted territory of jobs. Yeah. Nobody's coming out of school with the degrees necessary right. to have a hire for a chief AI officer or a, even an AI DevOps person. It, it's it's a little bit nebulous right now. They haven't quite determined what that person is doing or, and even the companies aren't even sure what they're supposed to have. And we, mm -hmm. we can see all the time for companies. They're like, what, what are we, what should we be doing? Yeah, we heard AI is a big deal. What, what does that mean? Like they have no idea how it's, so sure. how, the, how would they hire somebody? You know, they wouldn't know. So they're hiring to something that they've got no uh, knowledge of. So there is no job descriptions out there yet because there's no people with those skill sets yet, or they're right. slowly developing it as we're learning here. I, I, and then just, I was just going to say that real quick, Robert, like the same thing you were just saying with jobs, go look at a current, I'll say US-based uh, uh, university syllabus on AI because God knows the, the, the universities are totally kind of trying to cash in an AI. Totally, right? But they need to create a syllabus. You need to create a course. What are you going to create a course about in generative AI necessarily if you if they don't necessarily? And what you'll see is that once again, they want to teach the students maybe the the engineering side of it. And that's fine. That's certainly one way to go, right? But that's not all there will be in the future. And I think I wouldn't be surprised if some students are getting a little misled with something that's big, bold, and shiny and says AI in the course title but it's taking them down perhaps a different path. Yeah, I can show you the course uh, rubrics for the University of Tennessee, the you know, the new the new degree they're launching in fall yeah. and, and and it's uh it, it is it is kind of like uh, building the ship as you're sailing it, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of these a lot of these courses are are on the on the generic premises of what they're going to be offering, but honestly they this is going to change in the fall and in October they're going to be it's going to be modified, but that's okay. That's the purpose of that course. But to get us back on topic, yeah. uh, a couple of the terms that when I was first learning about AI, maybe Andy can jump in because he's the, the brains of our operation. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a, the terms that kept on, I was hitting a brick wall. I was trying to read papers or more importantly, listen to people explain papers on YouTube. There's a guy I follow that does a great job of it. And um, it's the RNNs and transformers. And maybe those in, in the, in the list, they might want to know more about uh, those basic concepts because the transformer architecture, which came out in 2017, which is attention is all you need paper. Um, that is really what was the foundation of what we know today as large language models. And so maybe understanding what, a, what transformer means and, and how it differs from recurrent neural networks, RNNs that were proved previously the technology for, behind machine learning um, or, or language model. So maybe you want to share a little bit about your knowledge on that, Andy, if you have any. Yeah. So let me follow the, the very nice drill down that you started, starting with AI to ML to DL, which is deep learning. So deep learning is that subset that's a, a that's using deep neural networks. So that's another term of art here, neural networks, using those to accomplish some of the computing tasks that we're interested in. So Deep learning and deep 
neural networks are a general class of that include transformers that are the large language models. That's the architecture for those. I'll talk about that in a moment. But convolutional neural networks or CNNs are a part of that deep neural network set and recurrent neural networks are as well. Uh, so transformers are the, that special model that uses um, an attention uh, mechanism within the layers to decide on how to uh, apply prioritization, if you will, of, of the importance of certain terms that are in the inputs uh, to predict the next text that it's going to output. So it's, it's a text generative model, um, a transformer is, and it's, it's a specifically using this attention mechanism, which determines which of the terms in the input sequence are more important than others and have to be considered with higher value than others. Any questions about that? Yeah, look, that, and just to be clear on that, um, you know, the transformer is kind of a, uh, in, not an antithesis to RNN, but there it's a different architecture. Could you explain how it, yeah, so, kind of uh, and re recurrent is in so, a sequence, right? Yeah, a, a transformer is is really all about text generation, and a recurrent mm -hmm. neural network is typically used for processing sequences, so time sequences. Um, it, it basically preserves a recurrent neural network, preserves the state of the previous calculation, and then mm -hmm. applies that right. to the next in yeah. the sequence. That's not that's not necessary when you're trying to generate text, right? There you're just trying to say semantically, or, you know, or the mathematical representation of the semantics of the input. Now I want to generate text that's relevant to that and is responsive to some of the directive instructions that are coming through in the prompt. And and I think it's important to note that the, uh, the it might be that in my understanding is recurrent neural networks is 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 really how they were analyzing text prior to the transformer paper and the reason why they didn't get very far with RNN is because of the extreme uh, 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 well it because because it wasn't as uh, diverse or it wasn't computational heavy there's a reason why they they couldn't go very far with it. Well, it goes very far for particular applications. For example, a recurrent neural network would be I ideal for a time series prediction. So take a really massive amount of data, dump it into a deep neural network that's a recurrent neural network, and it can figure out what all of those various parameters are going to be in the next state, right? right. In the next right. step, if you will. So the, mm -hmm. the step sequence. Okay. Okay. So before you go, keep, because I, I love where you're going with this, Andy, but I want to take maybe just a branch off of transformers because you did mention semantic and I want to just take a brief pause here super quick for the math side of this. So let's just talk really quick about vectors and semantic search and mm -hmm. um, tensors and even what embeddings are. So I'm just going to kind of go off it's because I, I can't, I would know all this off the top of my head, but I understand the vector. So that's the mathematical object used to represent words, a vector. Uh, you might, people who are listening to this might know vector graphics. That's where I definitely heard of vector first. That's where uh, a picture, an image is broken down into basically the pixels, but then they're given a, a mathematical, uh, assigned some sort of mathematical figure. It's what essentially allows you to take a screenshot of, of us right now and um, turn it into a vector image, which would enable us to put this on a large billboard on the side of a road without it getting blurry or distorted along the way. It has to be turned into math. So you could think of vector that way. But we also use vector when it comes to transformers or large language models. So um, where each dimension corresponds to a feature attribute. So then, uh, Andy, you mentioned semantic search. That's a technique used to find relevant documents or passages based on their semantic meaning often using vector similarity. Okay, vector similarity. Well, we can start getting into this idea of vector space. We don't have to get too heady here. But if we just, if we can imagine to the best of our human brains, a multi, multi-dimensional space, not two or 3D, not even 4D, but like 128 dimensional space type idea or 500, whatever it is. And all these things are moving around in this, this kind of crazy space. Again, hard to, con to conceptualize because we don't have anything right past, past 3D, past uh, what we can understand. So 
all these things get uh, different assigned mathematical values. And then basically using, using trigonometry, using cosine similarity, measures the similar, similarity between two vectors defined as the cosine of the angle between them, which is kind of crazy to me. So like back when you're thinking about high school and going like, why do I need this trigonometry? Well, it turns out <laughs> it has a lot to do with how we, we think about semantic search and how words like dog and cat are similar because they're house pets, but they're also different in a lot of ways because one is a dog and a cat, but they could also, but then a cat and a lion might also be similar. And so all these things are happening in a vector space. And then we can think of the last one I would say just before we get too heady in this is embeddings. So that's a dense vector representation representations of words or phrases typically learned from large data sets and used as an input bringing us back around to where Andy was with LLMs and um, the transformer model. So just wanted to throw in the math in there because that's how this stuff is all sort of happening on the back end. And it's important because a lot of people going forward, a lot of businesses are going to want to train on their own data. We already do this. A lot of us already do this with our clients. And they're going to say, I want to train on my own data. And there's some like really fast ways to do it. And then there's some really deep, solid ways to have these models train on the data. And that really does go into how it's using vector space, how it's doing embeddings, how it's doing the semantic search, so that when it goes to retrieve that data as part of the LLM solution, whatever that search result is, that it's high quality data and it can be trusted about your company, about whatever it is that you have it trained on. Okay, <clears throat> I'll stop there. So let me just clarify that what, what Brian was just explaining has to do with a vector database that's that's a component of a system that would include a generative model that needs inputs that are relevant to the question. And you're not going to capture all of the knowledge necessary or, or have the, the right prioritization of knowledge within the pre-training of a GPT, which is an LLM that's a generative pre-trained transformer. Uh, so you need to have this external database with your company data, for example. He's talking about embeddings. That's the way of converting that data into mathematical representations that are then stored in a vector database, which records the directionality and proximity of each of those mathematical representations of the data. And then when you do a search against that database, it's going to find the things that are closest to in this dimensionality uh, is closest to the things that you're querying about. When which is why, are there, go ahead. Yeah. which is why that is so computationally heavy. Because mm -hmm. the more, the more la the, not layers, the more um, um, parameters, the more that tokens, come on, give me the word. Mm. The dimensions? The, the larger the model. Okay. The more those connections more are, that's right. The, the more parameters, that's the word I was looking for. Right. The more parameters, it is it, it, it exponentially increases in computational uh, bandwidth that is necessary to get those answers because you start finding the associations of these words in this vector sphere, like which is think of, think of it as a three dimensional, right? If if you're looking at a recurrent neural network, which is why I come and bring this up, it's linear, and so when you start doing the attention mechanism, it's it's kind of the first part of the sentence, the end of the sentence, and the middle of the sentence. Those words are connected together in, in the vector sphere. And then you're asking for the middle word, what other associations does it have in every other uh, occurrence in the human language of the word cat? And so you're looking, that's where the vector comes into place because with the attention mechanism, it's it's attaching itself to every word that has ever been associated with cat in a sentence, not just the one before, which is where mm. RNN comes into play. And so that's why the computational heaviness comes into uh is why it's so hard right now, why all these companies are building $100 billion data centers to comp compute this, because they're they're basically basing it on the current the current uh, science and infrastructure of the transformer mechanism uh, or the attention mechanism in the transformer paper. But <clears throat> as new technologies come out, as we've talked about in this on this call, they're hoping to, to to incorporate that linear piece in addition to the transformer piece. I mean, anyway. I should be clear let me, on that. Let me just, let me, I want to make sure that we maintain the distinction between the vector space that you're describing, mm -hmm. which is outboard to the large language model, which is a deep neural network. That vector database is a very different animal, but they're used together, the vector store to deliver inputs for context 
in the streaming through the deep neural network that generates the output. So right, but, but, two pieces. But vector, yeah, you're right. Vector is completely different. But in order to get to vector, you must start first start with an embedding, which gives it a, a numerical number. Yeah, and then that's, that's, that's right. stored in a vector database. So that's that's what we're talking about, vectors and embedding. So when so you take your company data right. and you put it into a vector database, the first step is to do embeddings of right. your data. Right. And right. That's so that's what is and, and and by the way, when you um when you do a retrieval, and that gets us to uh, you right. know, the retrieval <laughs> augmented generation process that we're describing here with these two pieces. When you go to retrieval, you have to take your question, the question that you pose to the LLM, you have to go and embed that so that it is comparable and can be compared to the embeddings that are in the vector data store. So now you can bring back all the relevant context data. They're translated out of the embeddings into text again. And then that serves as the input to the large language model. And so this is a great place to just pin real, point, put a pin real quick and say, okay, why what why is this important? You know, Robert and I were saying Robert was saying right before we went live, why is this important? It's important because think about the process that's happening. Think about how complex and crazy are are the the English languages and what what semantically we might mean by one thing or another. All through all four of us on this show could generally attempt if we had a piece of paper and it said explain this this concept, more than likely all four of us would come about it a slightly different way. We might use some common terms, but we might come about it at four different angles all to get to the same result. That's just human language. So the reason I bring this up is because everything you're talking about is exactly what's happening. Embeddings and transferring it and getting it over to the vector side and then back or and then where RAG comes into it and then where the language model has been pre-trained and all this stuff, which really comes back to say like, why is this important? Because the better you can get and being very specific about the goals and the tasks that you're trying to accomplish using a chatbot, like a like a ChatGPT or a Meta or any of them right now, the better the responses you're going to get. Because the more you can help the model better understand what it is you're trying to say, what do you mean when you say this thing? The better results you're going to get I, I, I because think it's more of this important than that. I think it's I think it's limitations because what the so what for me is if you understand. The, the 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 underlying architecture for how these models work you're you're not you're not going to be uh, uh, kind of caught in the hype right and more importantly like none of us here probably understand the basics of how a computer operates I don't zeros right. and ones on off all the basics yeah. I took computer science when I was in high in college but I since forgotten actually how a computer works like the the bare bones like if I were to go back in time a hundred years with the knowledge I have I could not create a computer. I mean, I just right. Right? So, so uh, my point is, <laughs> you that's need like a Turing test for knowledge. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So you might that we're not asking for that level of understanding. We're just uh, we're just suggesting that when you understand these basic concepts, you know that the language model. The reason why there's limitations is because of how this is how they operate, and then you can better strategize solutions for your yeah. organization, your company. So it's quite important. Not that you know all the inner workings and how the sausage is made per se, but you do need to understand the different brands of sausage and the different you know components of sausage. <laughs> you know, back when Windows Windows came out, way way back, you know, no, Windows ninety five, no, it didn't probably been before that ninety three, whatever it was. I remember as a as a teenager, maybe a little younger than that, I'm not sure. Just having to understand, I was probably twelve or thirteen, having to understand the concept of Windows and folders. Right, like how things are categorized underneath places, and and just logically, where would it reside if I needed to go find this file? Where would it reside in a Windows infrastructure when I'm looking at the screen? Because we weren't using mouses before that, so now you have to figure out how where you're going to go click. And once you have that better understanding of the infrastructure, like the structure of it, you got better at using the computer because now you say, "Oh, I understand how that works. I understand." What it like you said, Robert? I love the idea of this. What are the limitations, and how do I how do I protect myself from being disappointed when I get a get a certain result? And even better than that, if I get a poor result, how do I go back to the prompt and make updates in order to try to get a better result? Because you don't abandon it, you reword it, you give a little bit more context. There's a lot of different ways. Hell, one of the words we could talk about, one of the two of the terms, few shot. Now you don't need to know what few shot is. It's a weird term. 
few shot, but a few shot just means the ability to provide an LLM with examples. So forget few shot. It's, it just means give it an example. Hey, I need you to write this email sequence or I need, well, it's not even a sequence. I need an email, a cold email. This is what I think a cold email looks like. Right? In my best opinion, this is a great example of three cold emails. Okay, no, I need shot, and C, yeah. now write me an email. And yeah. zero shot. So and there's zero, shot, zero yeah. shot. So yeah. most of the work that we do with chat GPT is zero shot. We just ask our question. We don't give it any right. examples. Mm -hmm. But it's really important that we're talking about this right now because one of the best ways to improve the outputs of whatever you're doing is to provide at least one example, right. and better yet, there's just a new paper that came out this week or in the last 10 days or so, which shows that the more examples you give, the better the result. If you give it 100 examples, that's you know, rateably better. I'm not sure that it's uh, you know linear or exponential. It's not exponential. It's going to be linear. I wouldn't have 100 examples. Significantly better. So shots are really the inoculation of the of the GPT to get can, into better results. If I can provide 100, 100 examples, I wouldn't need AI. <laughs> well, that's right. They, they did note in the paper that this imposes a significant burden on the preparation of data and, and, and prompts. Yeah. So. And, and I, you know, that, not, the, not the topic of the show, but I, I would really, I don't know that I would push back on that. I just, I will say that I have not always found that to be the case. And I will just say that, me, but it, but again, it's probably input user error. It is it is probably me. I'm more than willing to say that. Maybe my examples weren't like my hundred examples weren't dead on. What I have found that if there is a tipping point for me, usually past five examples, where the response for me starts to starts to um, okay, decrease. Yeah, yeah. And I think the reason is is because like the way I've always thought about it is I, I'm starting to confuse the model. I'm starting to confuse it as to what it is I think, and it's looking at the examples and then going, I, I don't like two of these. I can I can handle three, four, or five. There's starting to be too much differences between the examples, which is why I say the answer is probably a hundred. A hundred examples is probably right, but they have to be the right hundred examples. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that, right, that right, right, right. Yeah, so, like, we don't need to get heady there, but that's like that's yeah. yeah. The and, I just do a lightning round with uh, yeah. with Craig's comment. You want to post that and do a lightning round. Sure. Uh, we can, but I want to make sure we get Jimmy too, who hasn't, you haven't really had much of an opportunity here, Jimmy. Oh, so. no, no, no. I would, I, I was just reiterating what you were saying there. And, you know, the overall goal is to get to zero shot. That's, that's what, that's yeah. what everybody wants. Exactly. Everyone yeah. wants to just say, you know, two sentences and then the AI figures out everything else that we want. Right. It's all about yeah. uh, anticipation there. Okay. But, so yeah, let's, let's, let's go through let's what you're saying. LLM is obviously large language model. Uh, mm -hmm. Token is, as we talked about on last yesterday's call, is a uh, way that the language models uh, splice up the human language. So a token is a, a fraction, or it could be a whole word, or it could be fractions of a word that they use to um, uh, splice up and then use that as part of the um, input and output of, of, a, of the prompt. Weights... Uh, could you explain this a little bit more, Andy? Sure. So when you uh, go through training in the in the large language model, you feed it a bunch of data and it flows through all the, the hidden layers in the deep neural network. And as that is done, the computation that is resulting at each uh, neuron within each layer is to determine what the factor is the mathematical factor or the weight that it's going to pass on when presented with that uh, thing. And there's a concept called learning rate, and you can make those weights change quickly or slow down the rate at which they change with additional training. But refining those weights is the way that you uh, create the ability of that large language model or any deep neural network to make a prediction. And so the weights are the parameters. That's the parameter, right? There's also another one called bias. So the weights and biases are the key parameters in the layers of neurons in the deep neural network that make it possible to do these text predictions. And so I'll just throw an example, a recent example. Mark Zuckerberg recently, when he announced Llama 3, announced three different versions, the third of which is like 400 billion parameters and it's not out yet. And he said in the video that he released on Facebook and, and social media that it's still being trained. 
And one of the things we can probably assume from that is that they're still assigning and adjusting weights as part of that training of that model. It's not ready to be public because it probably would not give us great results. They're still training that large model and weights are probably part of it. Um, I'll take temperature really quick because it's on there. Temperature is another way of saying creativity. That's it. That's a, just an easy way to do it. There, if you're using ChatGPT, you cannot adjust temperature. It's already preset. It's something like 0.7, although I think it's now more variable than it used to be in the past. It used to be like a hard 0.7. All you really need to know is like if you go to the playground, which is sort of the sandbox version of uh, using the API. And then many other ways with using API, you can adjust the temperature. And there's some really, really great ways to do that. Uh, the example that Rachel Woods gave me when she taught me about train, uh, temperature a year and a half ago was if I said it to zero, meaning zero temperature, meaning zero creativity, and I say the sky is, and I hit enter, it will say blue. And if I erase blue and I hit enter again, it will say blue. And it will say blue for as many times as I erase and hit enter again. There's no creativity. The sky is blue. Very as you I think creativity that, and variation are also kind of uh, so like it, it's creativity um, makes variations of that. Like of the answer, yeah, you have the answer, yeah. So it's 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 not that it's being repetitive or it only has one answer. It's just that it doesn't it doesn't. Uh, get creative i guess like it's the only yeah. part i can think of so it might look like, as you go up and you go towards like 0. 0.7 or whatever it is 0. 0.1 it's going to start saying it might it might say something like the sky is a uh indigo color of whatever whatever like it's going to come up with an answer because it's going to be predicting the next word if you hit mm -hmm. delete the chances when you if you hold the temperature the same of getting the exact same answer are i don't know if it's impossible it's not impossible but i don't know what that percentage is it's low so as we move temperature up and the creativity and the variance and the randomness comes into it, now once you go past like 1 to 1 1.5, at least in my old experiences, it starts giving you almost gibberish. So it's moved past the point where it's helpful anymore. And now you're getting a, just a random assortment of words that don't really have anything to do with the sky is. So anyway, that's temperature. Um, please, please, somebody solve agent who wants to take agent. This is probably my biggest pet peeve right now is the term agent and it being misused. Uh, okay, I can well, do it. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, I mean, agent. It, agent to me is very simple. It's it's basically uh, allowing cr creating, getting to the point where an AI or a language model specifically can perform autonomous tasks that is given to it by a human. More importantly, though, without direction. So, for example, if I say uh, book an airline ticket to uh, Bahamas, it, it, it can do the steps necessary to accomplish that task. An agent is differently different than an assistant. An agent can go out and know that in order to book a ticket, you need to go to Delta.com or or a, or Expedia. It's going to know to go to a website. It's going to know to book it. It's going to know to ask questions that are going to either need to be answered by the human or it creates another uh, autonomous agent to answer the, the question, right? Um, which is the airport and he has to find out what the airport code is and, and know what the times are, whatever. So an agent, I guess autonomous agent is where I, I, I kind of go toward, allows the user to make run request and the AI to be able to accomplish the multiple steps in order to accomplish that task. Andy, where, uh, where that, am I doing? That's right. You're on, you're on track. And just to refine the distinction between an assistant and an agent, as you as you said, an, an agent is operationally autonomous and can act in different environments. An assistant is the LLM itself. It's going to support you in in just providing some guidance. Like so, it's assisting you in the human computer interaction. An agent can actually go out and do things in the on the web and elsewhere if it has you know embodiment in robotics. And I'll just give us a quick shout out. Go back and, and watch the episode, listen to the episode from uh, April 12th on HyperWrite. We did a um, review of HyperWrite. Part of that, I did a quick demonstration of the closest thing I've seen to an agent where the actual um, program, if you will, on my computer takes over my mouse after I give it an instruction and attempts to go and do that across multiple different uh, programs. It opens up Microsoft Word. It might go over to Spotify. It might go to the Chrome or whatever. And it explains itself as it's going. Now, more times than not, it's wrong. 
which is why this is great to explain right now that if somebody is selling, this is why this is important. If some company is selling you an AI agent autonomous solution, they are probably lying to you. They're probably stretching the truth significantly. And this is important. I wouldn't I say that I there are, what, you can do what it do we have out there that's a true agent. What do we have right now? They, they, there's, they, they've had it for six months. It doesn't always operate properly. Um, it doesn't always operate efficiently, but I, I haven't played with it for six months. So they might've gotten better since then. But I originally had played with it and said, do this task. And it would go and I watch it work. And would like, it was very, very interesting, but I don't know. There might be people that can develop those at this point, but. Well, and I, there's a, there's a company called Adept that is focused on uh, autonomous agents and, and this is the new, is they have them working very well right now. This yeah, is this the is new, coming. uh, this is coming. Called? That's what everybody is looking to accomplish. It was right. first like language models and in in having a chat bot or whatever. This is the new, gosh, the word I'm trying to look at the new frontier. There it is. Yeah, that's, and that's and just frontier. just yesterday, uh, I read that Mark Zuckerberg in a in an interview was talking about Llama four and its its use in developing Llama five to be perfectly agentic. So mm -hmm. Llama 5, when it comes out, they intend that to be an agent, not just an assistant. And so this is what I would say in this really quick is, um, and then we'll, we'll try to hit the last couple uh, um, terms here, is if you're, if you're a business right now, it's okay to think about, oh, what will happen when a true autonomous agent is available to my company to do things on behalf of the company, so on and so forth. Right now, though, Focus on what you can control, and that's going to be a lot more of the assistant, the AI, the human in the loop. Think about the small tasks that you can get off your company or your employee's plate that can be replaced by an LLM, some sort of AI solution to take that off the plate and make things move more efficiently. But assume that there's still going to have to be a human in the loop because that's where we currently are. Now, six months from now, I may have a different answer, but I certainly don't want anybody getting, you know, um, paying money, especially, especially paying money and then like signing over like a 12 month contract, you know, subscription where you're paying out the whole year in advance for technology that's moving very, very fast. And I've seen this. I've heard people talk about it on calls and they're spouting the term agent. I will just say, be careful, just be careful and make sure you fully understand what it is this company is, is claiming to do for you because more than likely as of April, it's probably not a true autonomous agent. It, it, yeah. I, I agree with you, Brian. And I think part of the confusion is that one of the principal ways that LLMs are being employed in enterprise and in small business is as a customer service agent. Right. So if we're they're they're going to say oh, we're going to provide you with an AI agent, they may be just simply saying that we're going to create an an, a a, an LLM that's going right. to work as an assistant to respond to customer inquiries. Yeah, um, I know we're on time here. We're at, we're out of time, really. Uh, the other words on here were like prompt. Um, I think you know, look, a prompt is is what you are putting in as the end user in order to get the response back out of the the assistant, chat line, the assistant. Oh, the assistant. Yes, there you go. um do we want to hit do you andy do you want to take a shot of prompt injection uh, we already uh, talked about shot prompt injection is a term that's used to capture a, a generally nefarious effort to use prompting in, in, in modified prompts that are tricking the LLM into revealing information either about itself that shouldn't be disclosed or to do something that's against its principles as, as, as governed by instructions that are provided in the system instructions, the developer of the AI. So mm -hmm. you, you can get it to, you know, tell you how to build, an a, you know, build an APOM bomb, for example, that you would use prompt injection as the way of getting that result out. Um, shot, we already talked about those are like examples. Markdown, that is a style of um that is a style of text, writing, text if you will. formatting. It's basically text, text formatting. Form. Yeah. And and it's also understood that formatting, markdown, the specific formatting of that, which uses a, a very specific kind of characters uh, like you know, hash signs and or dashes and so on in particular ways. The AIs understand that structure. 
and and know the hierarchy of markdown. So it's a it's an important thing to learn if you're going to do structured prompts. Mm -hmm. And if you and I will say this, um, if you've been messing around with Meta AI like I have, because I'm very impressed with it right now. Um, I asked it straight up, like Meta, do you do you work better, more efficiently when people use Markdown? And it said yes. It actually, it, this is the answer from Meta. It helps me better understand the context and what the end goal is, essentially. So there's a lot of value to it. Last one on there is multimodal. That's a great one. Multimodal refers to the use of multiple forms of input and output, such as text, images, audio, video, gestures, to interact with a computer system or AI model. Read that right off the screen. But that's basically what multimodal is. You're seeing a lot more of this. Uh, a good example of multimodal would just be using ChatGPT these days. In the past, Dolly 2 and Dolly 3 were ex were outside of that. You used a different tool to get images. Nowadays, you can just be in a chat. Meta.ai does the same. And it will just, so does Google. And it will just create images along with um, text. And so we will see well, a continuation in this area, What, um, which is to say that in short order, you will use one sort of assistant, if you will, and it might be able to respond back to you in voice. It's the sound. It might be able to do images. It can do text. It can do all of them together. It might be able to produce a video and a short summary. So instead of just getting an answer back of what, here's my question, here's the answer, it might provide it. It might pr produce a 30 second video with images and, and talk over just like you would see on YouTube explaining the concept back to me. That would be multimodal. So going, using it going both ways, images going in, images coming out, so on and so forth. Okay. And, Je and Greg said, Gemini said, no, I think he's referring to probably um, to Markdown, if I had to guess, uh, that Gemini says, no, it doesn't need Markdown. By the way, ChatGPT says the same thing. Meta says it helps. So there you go. Um, all right, we're we're on time, so we're going to let this go. Uh, hopefully this was helpful. I think when we definitely covered a lot of terms, but more importantly, you know, just understanding the concepts behind it, it will help you when you go to use these tools. It will help you to, to have better... Um, expectations, I think. And managing expectations is a huge part of having success, both yourself and with your team, at your job, at your company. If you're just deploying AI, setting and managing expectations is going to be a huge part of the future success of these AI deployments. So hopefully this is helpful. Tomorrow we'll be back with the news. Um, but until then, we'll see you guys. And uh, thanks for all the great conversations. Thanks, Greg, for the comments as well. Bye, guys. Hold on.